Uh, Patty Hyde is Canada's Minister of Labour and Workforce Development. She's with me now in the studio. Good to see you. Nice to Thanks see you. Thanks for coming to speak with you. Look, let's break down the budget proposals for uh, skills training and go through what they mean for Canadian workers. I want to do that in a second. But let's start with this. What is the problem or the challenge that the, these measures are trying to solve with the Canadian workforce? Well, it's a great question, and I think there's a couple different problems or challenges. One is that um, employers are saying that they need more talent and they need more skills and they need different skills than the kinds of skills that are coming out of colleges and universities exclusively, and they need to be able to actually rapidly upskill sometimes their own employees. Uh, the other challenge that we're having is that people feel that uh, they're not able to access skills development no matter where they're at. So whether or not we're talking about a young person worried about going to post-secondary because education is too expensive or someone who's uh, you know working at a job who'd love to take that extra course to maybe move up the ladder in their particular workforce and it's not paid for by the mm -hmm. employer they don't have uh, the confidence that they're going to be able to afford that or have the time to be able to do that properly so we really are trying to get at the sort of increasing shortage in the labor market and the demand from employers to have really highly skilled Canadians to take these jobs and on the other side from Canadians who say they want their the best opportunity to, to succeed. Okay, let's let's break it down. The, the Canada training benefit, that's that's one of the, the measures. Um, how will it work? It's a non-taxable non credit fund that workers can use for training. So what are the rules? So we'll be working out the really specific detailed rules that will apply to this fund, but the premise is that people will be able to access up to $250 a year that is stackable uh, to a maximum of $5,000 for a lifetime. Over four years, they could take, for example, they could get the credit of $1,000 towards a, a, a tuition, uh, as well as compensating time off as well to, to really... Um, uh, ensure that we're addressing one of the main concerns that we heard from Canadians, which is uh, not only is skills training sometimes access inaccessible because of affordability, uh, there's also sometimes time crunches in terms right. of how where do you fit that in. So this is the, the I piece that says, look, if you can be away for up to four weeks. I think it's every four years up to four weeks, right. and you'll get 55% of your salary for the time you're gone. Right, and we know that not all Canadians will need that leave, but that some might uh, some might be able to use that leave in a way that will help them uh, take a really intensive course that's going to help improve their earning potential of their uh, career. Okay, so we're, we're already hearing some pushback from, from some employers suggesting, look, like, what are the rules around this going to be? So if I have an employee who wants to go away for four, four weeks on a training course, um, uh, I'm going to be asked to hold that job for that employee, but what if they're going off to take training and has nothing to do with the job they're doing for me? Do I still have to hold a job for them? So that's when I say we need to work out the details of how this is going to work. And we're going to be holding consultations very soon with employers, uh, with, uh, you know, with Canadians, uh, with interested stakeholders, with trainers to find out what actually makes sense and what kinds of rules and parameters will guide this. I'll also say that there's a rebate for small uh, employers, uh, small and medium-sized businesses, the on the EI payments. Because we know that, um, in fact, that you know, we don't want to disadvantage small businesses or medium-sized businesses who are um, investing in, in their employees by allowing them that time to actually improve their skills. But at the end of the day, here's what, what I heard and what I continue to hear from employers across the country, and that is that there is a shortage of skilled people in the labor market, that employers are looking for uh, highly skilled or uh, you know, uh, people that are ready to work with things like soft skills, with things like um, technical skills, with things like digital skills, and they're finding it harder and harder to find those folks. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to address the concerns of employers as well as making sure Canadians have that, that Opportunity. A couple of things that raises, are, are, are you convinced, let's use the example of, a, of at some point you've collected in your tax credit bank, you've collected $1,000, so you want to go take a training course uh, that let's say costs $1,000, you get $500 back. A couple of things that raises, I guess, a, a lot of things, training courses are more expensive than $1,000. And, and B, uh, are you convinced that enough people will want to spend 1000 to get 500 back? You know, I think about my own experience as an adult uh, going back to university as a part-time student and, uh, you know, course by course by course working my way to graduate with a BA at 28. Uh, you know, and I did do that as a nighttime uh, student, as someone who worked full-time and paid for those courses one course at a time. So I think, you know, it can go a long way to actually offsetting the cost for Canadians. But also, if you think about the smaller amounts, I mean, maybe somebody needs a CPR or first aid certificate to move up the rank 
ranks in their particular corporation. Or maybe they're, uh, you know, working in office administration and there's a, an Excel course that they can actually take that will help offset the burden of the cost, sometimes for mm -hmm. the employer, I might point out, uh, but make that employee that much more efficient and that much better at their job and also able to look for opportunities within that organization to move up their career trajectory. I think that, you know, when employers think collectively and understand that more trained people in the job market pool is good for everyone, I think that they'll realize this is a real asset to them as well. And I guess uh, I had one person make, make a point to me in, in our bu budget coverage that look, uh, okay, so what's the, all if, if employers don't want to release them to improve their skills, in many cases they're improving their skills for the job they're in or at the company they're in, what do you want to do? Keep the employer that's, so you, if you say no, you've got an employee who's not operating at their highest capacity. So there's obviously the point, the advantage to the, to the, to the company too. But that takes me to this question. And some people have suggested, like, why does the government have to do this? If, if it's about up-training employees in workplaces, why aren't the companies paying for it? Well, I don't, I, you know, listen, I think the government wants to do this. This liberal government wants to do this because we understand that when people have confidence in their abilities, opportunities to reach their full potential, not only is it good for that individual and their family, it's good for the entire economy. The more that people feel confidence about their ability to reach their true potential, the more their earnings go up, the more they actually are, you know, changing sometimes generational patterns in education and training, the better it is for Canada, the better it is for their communities, and the better it is for our economy overall. So we we really believe that when you have everyone reaching their full potential, that's when we can see the, the best growth in our country. It's kind of, been, let's let's touch on it at least briefly, it's kind of, it was missed a little bit in the bigger picture of the of the people in the workforce, but there's also measures in the budget for uh, for students on the tuition side, and that involves lowering uh, interest rates on student loans and, and uh, allowing that six month time after the time they leave university where they're, uh, they're you know, when the payback does start, mm -hmm. that six month period won't include interest on the on the money they owe. That's right. uh, how significant do you think that is? I think it's really significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, that six month grace period, as you point out, is a time it's designed for a student who's graduating to figure out their next steps, find that good paying job, uh, you know, move forward in their life and not worry about their Canada student loan. The challenge has been up till our government that it's been a bit dishonest and in that interest was accumulating from the very first day at the conclusion of their studies. And so not only is this interest, but this is compound interest. So students' debt is growing during those six months that they're not making any payments. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, if we're talking about a six month grace period, it really is that. And there's no sort of fine print on that. Secondly, in terms of interest rates, I mean, why should uh, students be paying exceedingly high interest rates on Canada students' loans? So we're lowering the interest rate for for um, for variable rate loans which 99% of students have to prime and you know this seems prime plus uh Sorry, so prime, right. and so th th this. Because now I think it's prime. Yeah, prime plus that's two, right. right. And so this is this is uh, this is fair. This is fairness. This is you know trying to make sure that education is affordable, that students aren't worried about that debt that they're going to accumulate, and that they can get out of debt faster uh, when they actually conclude their studies and get that great pay. Okay, I have to ask you why you're here before I let you go. It was quite the scene yesterday when Bill Morneau was trying to deliver the budget speech and he was being yelled down, and Jody Wilson-Raybould was sitting in the front benches uh, during the budget speech, and uh, and I want to ask you. Uh, this this, the Justice Committee has been shut down. She's not going to have a chance to tell more of the story she says she has to tell. Are you okay with that? Uh, listen, the Justice Committee is doing their work and they're calling the witnesses and they've concluded their studies uh, on this particular chapter. What I will say is that uh, the former Attorney General had four hours with the committee. In fact, 40 minutes of um, testimony uh, in, at, the, at the beginning of the meeting, another three hours of questioning. Um, she had a, a lot of time in front of the Justice she Committee. she's not done. And I will say that the Justice Committee is in control of its own agenda. So I will say also about the scene yesterday that I uh, was asked by some reporters after after the conclusion of uh, the finance minister's presentation of the budget, whether or not I thought this was disrespectful to uh, Liberal and members of Parliament. And I will repeat that I thought it was incredibly disrespectful to Canadians. It was incredibly disrespectful to the stakeholders that were sitting up in the audience, Indigenous leaders, stakeholders from student groups, from labour groups, individuals that have worked on things like access to uh, supports for rare disease medication. These are the folks that work tirelessly every Every day to make sure that the, their their members, that the people they advocate for, represent are represented in that budget, okay. and that's who it was disrespectful Fair enough. to. But but how do you feel about the? As far as you're concerned, the SNC-Lavalin affair is closed. We don't need to hear from Jody Wilson-Raybould anymore, even though she says she has more to say. 
I am incredibly proud of a Prime Minister who has listened to the concerns of the former Attorney General, listened to the concerns of caucus, uh, is taking active steps to examine, uh, you know, the, the, the functioning of his own office, whether or not that role should be separated. These are actions of a Prime Minister who has acknowledged that clearly uh, the former Attorney General uh, you know, felt that she was being pressured, uh, that he wants to make sure we have a, st a system that uh, this doesn't happen again to any other minister in his office. And, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the fact that he's taken it to heart. And I, I look forward to the results of uh, and the report of the Justice Committee. And I, I think that we're on the right track. All right, Patty, I do. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.